It's coming. Pretty, uh, pretty, pretty interesting uh, set of events uh, taking place now, and that's what I wanted to talk about today. One or two of you have heard me talk about this before, and so I apologize if there's a bit of a repeat. But um, you know, um, you know, I'm way too old now to actually do anything. So now I try and think about what other people are doing. So this is a little bit of a step back and say, you know, what is actually going on right now? So I think there's a bunch of trends that a lot of us are familiar with, and um, I'm just trying to sort of put them together in one in, in, in one in one place. Because I think it explains a lot of what's happening with SDN and NFE. And I think that there's three things that are extremely relevant to the discussion today. One is clearly the rise of open source software. The second is rise of merchant switching chips. And rise of merchant switching chips is pretty important at part of this whole SDN uh, change and movement. And the third one, which is really the driver, the need for operators to reduce cost and differentiate the service that they provide. So let's take a look at software in 2014. I'm going to say something that you all know, but I'm going to put it all together in one slide. And it's really quite revealing, I think. So 75% of smartphones that are sold today are based on an open source operating system. We all know that, Android, right? About two-thirds of all web browsers that are in, in use today, or rather two-thirds of use of web browsers, is for open source uh, browser. About two-thirds of websites are based on open source software. Data center servers, about 70%, probably a little bit higher than that, are based on open source software. Tablets that are sold, about two-thirds. Mainframes, about two-thirds. Who would have thought that, right? Um, supercomputers, all supercomputers super computers except one apparently, run open, are based on open source software today. <coughs> and all of these numbers are still growing to the extent that they can. And uh, it's quite a remarkable change because if you just track these numbers over the last few years, obviously there's been a huge change. And what is it that they're using the open source for? It's for pieces of infrastructure that are necessary but non-differentiated. Right? In all of these cases, it's pieces of infrastructure that are necessary but non-differentiated. Okay. And you get all the benefit of everybody else doing the QA for you and the development. It's more agile, reliable, and secure, but it's used where essential but non-differentiated. Right? This is part of the, 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 you've all heard this statement before. But it's worth thinking about what this means in the context of, of what we're doing here. It means that... Over time, and I couldn't tell you whether this is one year, five year, 10 years, all of the essential but non-differentiating parts of the infrastructure, and what is the network? It's infrastructure. Will be open source, right? And that's why we're here, why we're here today, and why there are so many open source projects going on in networking. Let's have a look at the second one, the merchant switching uh, chips. So this is a bare metal switch. There are many types of, let's just call them generically low cost switches. They may be bare metal, they may have a logo on it, it doesn't particularly matter for this discussion. And what do they have inside? They have the CPU, not dissimilar to the one in the servers, DRAM the same as in the servers, and the power supply and the fan is pretty much the same. And then they have a switching chip sitting next to it. Um, and uh, this is just an example of, of one of them. And then the whole thing is put in, in, in sheet metal, and then it typically runs Linux. I remember being laughed out of the room about 10 years ago when suggesting that networking equipment should be running Linux. Right. Now, it's, you would almost not think of using anything else, right? It really is changing very fast for the, for the switches. And it doesn't matter whether it's a logoed switch or an unlogoed switch, this is pretty much what's happening. And the way in which this is developing on the switch itself, it's programmable hardware, Open source, the necessary, the essential, but non-differentiating part of the system. And then the proprietary software that sits on top, either to differentiate that box from something else, or sitting off the box if that's being remotely controlled. And it's happening really fast. You've probably all seen this picture of the OCP wedge switch with the, uh, the, 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 the Broadcom Trident, the Trident 2 switch in here. And uh, there's kind of nothing in there, right? It's programmable hardware. You can't see the open source. So this, this, again, whether that's sold with a logo on it doesn't particularly matter. This, this, these two things are going hand in hand because it's becoming possible to load that software on something from somewhere else. Right? So you can buy your own. We're seeing this with bright boxes, with all sorts of stuff, the sort of the disaggregation that's taking place. And if you look at the various pieces of software that are coming out, 
since OCP networking started last year, we've seen lots of things popping up. Right? The bootloader that you can now get, only the open source, kind of getting there, the open source API and drivers with OFTPA, open networking Linux, and there are alternatives to this as the as Linux running on the box. All of these designed to work together. A forwarding agent, there are several that are available, there's probably ones that I've forgotten. Various types of open source forwarding agent or in the process of being made, made open. Then an optional remote API to a network control plane. That's clearly what we're thinking about here. Choices, ONOS, ODL, various other types of open source. Again, my apologies if I've forgotten any there. But all of these have started to emerge in the last year or two. And it's not that we've just been looking and now we've seen them. If you think about the rate of creation, the rate of availability, the number of people that are involved in developing this, Three or four years ago, it was almost impossible to find anybody who would risk spending their time on open software for open source software for networking. There's a real struggle to find anybody that would do that. Now, it's like what we're all doing, right? It's what everyone is doing, because you can see the, uh, the necessity for that essential but non-differentiating piece. What it means for, the, for those who operate in, in, in node networks is the, the creation of those rather, uh, uh, rather small boxes at the top that are, of course, extremely complicated. They're the differentiating pieces of proprietary software. And if anything, the biggest challenge that comes out of this is not the pieces here, because they're shaping up. The hard part is figuring out what are those proprietary differentiating use cases and services that will be created on top. But luckily, for most of us, that's on our job. That's left for those that own and operate large networks. So what is it that's kind of going on in, in, in this sort of need? You'll have all seen um, the, 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 the pictures before, but I want to, I want to repeat this one because I think it's kind of, it sort of clarifies what's the, 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 the sort of the problem facing the, the, the large network operator. The traffic is growing at 40 to 50% per year, right? Depends on who you ask and how you count. Um, my monthly bill is not changing, and if it is changing, it's going down, not up. Therefore, the cost of ownership has to reduce by 40 to 50% per gigabit per second per year. But in practice, depending again on who you ask, it seems to be reducing by about 20% per gigabit per second per year, i.e. the margin is, is closing at about 20% per year. You've all seen this picture. I've seen this from, I think it's seven different operators now. None of them have the numbers on, except the $30 a month. Revenue, again, slightly going down. Growth in traffic going up like this. The total cost, the total cost per gigabit per second per year, is 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 increasing, and therefore there comes a point. Is this depending on who you ask? Where is that point at which essentially the margin goes away? And uh, so, what do you do if you're faced with this uh, this problem? You've really got three choices. Right? One is you reduce capital cost to try and stay to reduce that cost per gigabit per second. Move to simpler hardware and an open source control plane is one example, right? I think, again, that's partly why we're here. Reduce operational cost, which is once you've done that, throw out all the features you don't need so you don't have to support them. Focus the effort on supporting those features that you need. So you can streamline the protocols, features, and the software. Throw out stuff that you don't need. And then you increase the price. How do they increase the price? You increase the price by providing a different service to you from your competitors. So AT&T and Verizon, if they're trying to sell the same service to the US government, then if they have to do it off the same services, off the same IETF defined services on the same boxes, you can't differentiate. If you own the software and can define the software, it gives you ability to define new proprietary services. The good thing is we all win. We all win because the service gets better. So in the end, it's all in service of this. And if we can make this happen, the differentiated services to allow them to be more profitable and stay in business, we all benefit. So the internet was originally designed, right? And I just want to say a little bit about the context in which this is operating. Right? And uh, this is the sort of the, the obligatory dig at the at the vendor community, but I think it is kind of necessary to sort of point out where we're at right now. So the internet was originally designed to be simple and, and streamlined and have this decentralized control. Right, these were two fantastic properties of the original internet, which led to explosive organic growth of the internet that we all know about, and a great business for companies selling routers. Right, so all of these things were true. The problem was that this simple and streamlined was directly in tension with a great business. 
Because there's very few businesses that are extremely successful over a long period of time that are simple and streamlined. Right? So you, this is not sustainable. If it's simple and streamlined, if it was going to stay simple and streamlined, it had to become a commodity. And therefore, you wouldn't be able to maintain a great business. So what do you do? If you're in that situation, one is you do vertical integration. <laughs> I'm not suggesting this is a conspiracy. It's a natural, it's naturally what the industry will do. So you want to keep things closed and proprietary. You want the network management to have restricted control. So in the case of the CLI, we all know it's grossly lacking, right? And I don't mean specifically of this box, but of generally of, the, of, of, of our industry. So vertical integration is one strategy. The other one is to create a high barrier to entry. How do you do that? You make it really complicated, right? You make it very complicated to make it very hard for other people. What are the metrics of complication? Here is one, the number of published internet standards as a function of time. Most of them come from those who sell routers, right? Understandable. So these are natural, th natural things that an industry will do in response. And really, I think what, what's going on here is a resetting of, 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 of what's taking place and saying, completely understand that the vendors should be having these strategies. That's exactly what, what, what they should do in order to maintain that, that they maintain that situation. But if you move that control to those who are providing the service and empower them to change and modify and evolve that service over time, then it, it, it pushes back against these, the, these practices that are not particularly helpful to them. Okay, I'm going to jump over this one. So really, these, these SDN and NFE, in the end, I think are, 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 are inevitable because of rise of Linux and open source in general. I mean, Linux is clearly the leading part of that, but all the open source effort. A rise of simpler servers and switches, bare metal servers, bare metal switches, but generally lower cost disaggregated switches and servers. NFE came about because of the rise of virtualization, to computer virtualization, and SDN really because of the rise of virtual switching silicon. And all of these things together really make SDN and NFE kind of inevitable. Why do I say that? Well, what is, NF what is SDN except the movement of the control plane out of the forwarding plane? That's made possible by have merchants switch with switching silicon here to reduce the cost. The remote control plane maintaining the map, the control programs written by those who own and operate networks. So that's really enabled by the simplification of the forwarding plane. And then in the case of NFE, those middle boxes, <coughs> you all uh, love to hate, those middle boxes sitting in the middle that sit between the network and the outside world, those being moved to VMs on servers. So virtualization has been key here. My own view of where this kind of goes over time, this is a sort of a simplified, sim simplified picture of where I think this takes us. This would be my kind of assumption of where we will be in five or 10 years. Programmable hardware in terms of servers, VMs, switches hardware and software, radios and optical circuits, all sitting locally controlled by a local operating system, this wrapped in some kind of sheet metal with or without a logo, right, as the individual components of a network, with a unified converged <coughs> control plane. UNOS isn't that control plane. There isn't such a control plane today that can do that, but I think it's a worthy goal of where a number of the, 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 the control plane activities uh, uh, should, should head. What that leaves for those who own and operate networks is to do all of their stuff on top as proprietary or contracted out third party apps or apps that they develop themselves to run on top of this. But this is the piece of the infrastructure that I think, and I think that's how the infrastructure will change over time. Somebody leaning against the light switch, because I keep saying the light switch. <laughs> Are you leaning against the light switch there? No? Somebody? Are you on there? Somebody, maybe. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> So why ONOS? Where does ONOS fit into this, into this, uh, this, this picture? Um, network operators need an open source control plane. Right? In fact, ideally, they will have several. Right? This will add to the list. That is good. Because if we have a variety of different approaches, it's the early days, then we get to see what works and what doesn't. My hope would be we bring all of those ideas together over time and that we can get the best. And if you think about how Linux came about, there are a whole bunch of different Unix-based operating systems around for several years. And that helped a bit of 
nice technical competition, which is always healthy, and then the adoption of ideas, and particularly those that were more liberally licensed, as is typical nowadays with open source software for networking, then it makes it very easy to sort of cherry pick the best from, from each. So this is all, I think of all this as a, as a goodness. But the network operators need this because it's very hard for any one company to develop this for themselves. Onos's position is clearly that you want this with HA and, and, and scalability built in from the ground up. That's one approach, right? And that's clearly a sort of a center point of, of Onos. And that's why we're here today, right? It's, <coughs> it's looking to see whether this is, a, this is a good approach. I like this quote. I have to keep quoting you on this because uh, uh, I think it's, 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 a, it's a very <coughs> useful quote. Um, and uh, I think it's sort of driving a lot of the interest and representative of a lot of the interest from the large operators. I think we all know who John Donovan is. I do think when we look back in 20 years to what is happening now, we will look at it as software ate our world. Right? Our world suddenly became about the software. The, the, the things that we have these three letter names for, I think we'll forget these names actually. I think it'll be about software. That it all became about software. And that's what the books will say. I think they'll think of these as somewhat quaint terms. I think that this, the network infrastructure will be much simpler than it is today. I don't think it'll be more complicated. I think it'll be simpler. Because as soon as you get to define the behavior in, in software, your tendency is to simplify, simplify the, the hardware. I think it'll have an open source infrastructure, and it'll have proprietary apps. Those proprietary apps are yet to be written, mostly. I think that network operators will have developed, because those that don't, or well, they'll have gone out of business. And so I think this will be the primary, uh, the primary activity of development activity in networking once these parts are figured out. So what it does mean is that there are a few years in which this gets figured out, this open source infrastructure. Just like the, the heyday of the innovation and the change that took place in Linux was probably about 10 years ago. There's still clearly a lot of development going on, but really the heyday in that creation and that definition, right? That heyday for networking is right now, right? And we're just seeing the, the, I think over the next couple of years, we'll see that really, really take off. And so I think it's gonna be wonderful to see all of that happen. I think one other thing that is gonna be interesting is that standards will still matter a little bit, but I think they'll have rapidly, they'll have diminished value. Because in a software environment, Standards matter, matter a lot less, and I think we're seeing this in all standards bodies that are struggling with this right now. It's just a natural evolution path, I think. But this is where the action is going to be. That's all I wanted to say. Does anybody have any, uh, any questions? Or, uh... Hello. Maybe say a few words about what's the role of multi-core in, in this movement, or you know, is multi-core is a pain? Multi-core is a chipset. Many cores. How is it playing a big role moving towards this approach of openness? Um, I think that uh, that the more programmability in when it comes to the networking piece, more programmability in in, in forwarding, I think is kind of inevitable because if you've got software, then you want to program. As to how you do it, that we many ways depending on where you are in the network. If you're in an environment where you need rich processing, then multi-core, whether it's specialized or general purpose, I think is, is quite likely. Somewhere else you might need something more fixed function, as like the typical kind of plumbing devices in, uh, in our closets today. So I think it depends on where you are in the network. There was one other question, I think. But... Very good. <laughs>